accurately reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Networks. The views and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the position of the management and staff of Guardian Networks. This morning, and welcome back to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM, your station for fresh news, smart talk all day. It is Wednesday, the 21st of February, 2024, and we welcome the day with Shine 242 with My Bahamas, another classic produced for the 50th Independence season. We say thank you, Shine, for continually adding to the catalog of our lives. It's a Wednesday, that means it's a man down mash up a Wednesday. Uh, today we're mashing up not just the two shows, but we're mashing a guest in here as well. Joining us today is a representative from the Organization for Responsible Government. And then after that conversation, we're delving into the papers. There's lots and lots of news, continuing conversations from the top of the week. But I want to draw your attention to today's Nassau Guardian. If you don't have the Guardian, you can also pick up the Tribune and find it in there. Turn to page A11 on the, in the Nassau Guardian. There's an official proclamation claiming Saturday the 24th of February 2024 as 242 day. It's on its way this, this Saturday, February the 24th, because every 24th day of the second month, is 242 Day. Show your Bahamian pride, fly your Bahamian flags, wear Bahamas flag colors, eat Bahamian foods, create and listen to Bahamian music, donate in sequences of 242 or 242, do something 242 times, 2.42 times, 24.2 times, and merchants consider using the 242 sequence for pricing items on that special day. It's going to be a good day. I'm hoping that tomorrow, for the rest of the week, we celebrate in 242 Day. On Saturday again this year, we celebrate in 242 Sports on Friday, and uh, we're going to be doing a little 242 Culture tomorrow. I got a text that says, the song sounds a lot like Just Cause She Fat To Me. There's like, I think they call that like maybe an interpolation, right? Where is you don't actually sample, like you don't pull the track out, but it's an interpretation of it, I think. I just like it. I mean, I think it's a, an anthem, you know, and it joins the number of anthems produced for our 50th Independence Celebration. Joining us this morning is Mr. Stephen Evans from the Organization of Responsible Governance. So for the first part of the show, we're talking governance. In the second part of the show, we're talking politics. <laughs> good morning, Mr. Evans. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And everybody at Org is okay? Everyone is doing well. Thanks. Good stuff. Good stuff. I miss you all. Yes, yes, yes. You are in our 2024 plan. So please. Governance. We are usually looking at the ways that politics impacts governance, yes. but we also want to look at the systems that make up governance Absolutely. and not just critique the politicians that operate them, but the systems them themselves. Right. And so a big part of talking politics is understanding the systems of governance that politicians are responsible for. Yeah. As 
go on. Well, I mean, and the reality is uh, our culture has created this landscape where the two seem to be conflated into one. Mm-hmm. But we're talking about two very, very, very different structures. From my own perspective, I have never really been into politics, which typically shocks people when they think about where I work. And I am still trying to figure out the who is who and the who did what at what point because my focus has always been on the structures that exist that that run the country, mm-hmm. uh, not independent of completely of politics, but definitely they do exist in and of themselves. And helping people to understand the difference, I think, is the way forward. Because if we don't get that there are the people, but then there is the structure and they are two different systems, um, we'll probably be stuck in the same place for a very long time. And I think a lot of us are sort of stuck trying to understand how political culture, the way that politicians operate, Mm -hmm. becomes a barrier to the fulfillment of policy, right? Right. Becomes a barrier to the success of policy or the enforcement of policy. Right. Um, What I miss most of all, sir, is access parliament. Oh, yes. <laughs> right? Uh, where um, uh, a team within org would follow the parliamentary yes. schedule, mm-hmm. alert citizens as to what's next on the parliamentary agenda, and provide brief synopsis and context for the conversations taking place in the House. Yeah, um, it's, it's really good that you actually bring that up because it's something that we plan to revitalize in 2024 um and i'm actually happy to share we've been working directly with the parliament and with the passage of the parliamentary services bill there there are portions of it that speak to allowing uh, ngos to assist with public education so we're trying to forage formal relationships because um shout out to tate who went off to to get his master's degree um and he definitely held the fort down with access parliament Uh, for us. uh, But the reality is behind the scenes, it is a challenge to keep up with what's going on. And you have to kind of know people and and, and have contacts in order to get the information, which isn't sustainable um, from from our perspective. But we we definitely applaud uh, the direction that the government is moving in, in terms of making more information readily available and, and forming partnerships and we are in talks about potentially even producing a series that could be shared um, on the parliament, parliamentary channel uh, in partnership with the parliament uh, to sort of take access parliament to the next level this year. So Absolutely. It would yeah. be great as a bill is being discussed. Right. right. If you have a split screen, yes. the bill is being discussed. You could list the prior bills, like maybe mm-hmm. this bill is replacing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. a bill. Maybe this, is, this bill is an amendment, which is replacing parts of an existing bill. Uh, you could talk about the stakeholders, constituents, right. or sectors of society that are impacted right, by the right. bill, or that the bill provides for. Mm-hmm. Um, you can list the NGOs that work on the issues being addressed by the bill. Right. And then you can link viewers to ministries and agencies that house statistics right. or information about the work that takes place around the bill, right? So if yeah. it's finance, regulations, bill, then you could say, listen, we'll depart um, inland revenue is one place. Ministry of Finance is one place you're going to go. Social Services is one place you're going to go because they collect the statistics that are used to determine how much money may be needed within this next period. Yeah, and I think another another thing um, that's really key for us is it it's a step toward more formal public consultation. So on the, I guess on the official books, the space in which a bill should be circulated for public commentary is during the second reading. And there, at this point, isn't necessarily a formal process to what that is supposed to look like. So if a bill is of public interest and we know that it will impact the wider public, for example, um, then they really should have a say on what that looks like and have the opportunity before it's passed um, to, to give their feedback. So we're also hoping through that and the Policy Review Center, um, which is sort of like the sister initiative of Access Parliament that is still up and running, that 
in addition to the information you talked about, which would be phenomenal to display, we can show people where it's at. Like, is this where it was introduced? Is it in the second reading? Is it in the Senate? Right. So they know that this is your opportunity to go and send your feedback yes. so that it can be incorporated into, hopefully incorporated into the debates. It's a slow and steady process, but it's the gold standard of, of public consultation. Absolutely. And it, it, it's a benefit for NGOs, citizens, and government actors and agencies yes. alike. It's also a profound benefit for politicians. Yes, yes. Right? It is a source of information that you can use to create a narrative. Yes. I'm so glad you said that because one of the things that, uh, as I said, um, being newer to politics and trying to learn as quickly as I can, um, I'm like, this stuff helps. You know what I mean? Like, if you want to really represent the voice of the people, you want, for example, people to vote for you or to be happy for you, what better way than to listen to them? Mm -hmm. You know, to listen to what they have, especially on the family islands, but, but throughout the country, right? When we do this, it's not a threat to anyone. Um, when, when the Bahamian people recognize their ability to influence policy and to positively contribute, and, and it's really support. Now, there may be criticism or critique that's constructive so that the thing actually works for me, but I think this can facilitate a shift of the culture that feedback is something that is a threat to political structures because the only thing that feedback will really do is strengthen. It may be discomfort. It may require change. It may require progressive ways of thinking. No pun intended. <laughs> but And it's um, information that you probably can't pay for. Right. Why right. would you uh, block it? Why would you deter it or right. discourage it? It's, it's a whole report without having to pay a consultancy fee, right? Precisely. Precisely. Uh, Mr. Evans, we've got a call on the line. Let's, let's go to this call. They seem eager to join the conversation. Good morning, caller. Morning, uh, Mr. Evans. Good morning. Uh, very quickly here, I think this is where the important office of the ombudsman comes in. Yes. Uh, it's too many times that bills have been tabled and passed in our parliament without the people participating in or having their voices heard, because we are the ones out here who's been impacted by these bills that's being passed. And uh, I think that is the missing component. It is so sad that successive governments have not found it necessary to create the office of an ombudsman for us to have our voices heard. And so this is something that a lot of us out here would like to see going forward. Any government that allows the voices of the people to be heard officially, I think that is a government for the people. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlo. We're going to get into definitely a sort of a follow-up on organization, response, organization for Responsible Governments campaign. Mm -hmm for an ombudsman yes. act, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what we were talking about just now, and thank you again, uh, Carla, we're going to speak specifically to Absolutely. the ombudsman's very, bill. Very, very important point. And the status of it in a moment. Another reason why the government should consider creating a, an environment of transparency and accountability through reinforcing systems that allow citizens to access information. We are looking at, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it a bit more today, the Bahamas is going to space. I mean, Aisha Bo is going to space, and she's taking all of us in her Georgie bundle. But we're venturing into space tourism, and uh, I really want to talk about it. I'm extremely excited about it. And when I raise the subject, a lot of people sort of cut their eye and say, you're getting ready to object, right? You're getting ready to oppose. And I say, well, listen, I do have a critical interrogation about the seeming lack of transparency around this activity, right? But it's not because I want to say, well, you can't do it unless you ask the Bahamian people. The point I want to make is that you need to give Bahamians an opportunity to prepare themselves to build capacity to be able to be stakeholders in any initiative taking place in their own country. Yeah. Now, so somebody can say, well, but, I mean, there's Aisha Bo, and then where's the next uh, astronaut, Aaron? It's not necessarily at that level that we're expecting participation. One of the uh, elements of this partnership that's being touted is the creation of an exhibition where a SpaceX suit will be on display. 
apparently it would be the first exhibition of this nature outside of the continental USA, right? And I'm thinking to myself, well, remember the astronaut that says that his favorite time of the day is when he's sitting over the Bahamas? Mm -hmm. I would, as a Bahamian, like an opportunity to be able to participate in the creation and operation and uh, uh, policy creation within this exhibition. I want to have an opportunity to curate a, an exhibition, a part of this exhibition. I want an opportunity to say Travolta Cooper, Lovato Stubbs, Maria Govan, Kareem Mortimer, Johnny Cake, all my, film, all my new and upcoming filmmakers, Nat Nat the filmmaker, uh, Moya Thompson, who's in charge of the film division in the Division of Culture in the Ministry of Youth Sports and Culture. Let's run a campaign. We need space documentaries. We need young Bahamians imagining Bahamians in space, right? We need every movie we could create. We need a documentary about experiences with UFOs and what they call them now, uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon, UAPs. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. And so having uh, knowing where the legislation is, knowing the timeline, knowing who the actors are, knowing what requirements, what certifications are required by law to be able to participate, these are the things that Bahamians need to not just support the government and whatever policy initiative it's taking up, but to grow a legacy for themselves, create new careers, create new industries. And you know that's how it works. And so it's not always about a complaint, it's about an opportunity to grow and expand. Yeah, and I think um, this, this kind of shows up in a lot of the ways that, that decisions are being made. It, it, is seldom just this is just so bad we just hate it we don't we don't want to see it but to your point when I looked at the story um, and admittedly this is something I'm not like a hundred percent well versed on but I've been following some of the developments and a lot of the comments I've seen particularly on social media people are asking who is going to benefit who's going to be able to participate mm -hmm. and while I wouldn't want to get too much into that specifically your point is the way that we make sure, regardless of what the thing is, if you talk to the people, if you look at who you have, if you create opportunities for people to say, yes, I think I have the expertise or skill or something that can be a benefit to this process, and you incorporate that feedback into the development of the policies that will govern this thing. So when it does happen, we, we're not looking back and thinking, well, wow, how did, how, did, how did we get to this point where so very few are benefiting? This is the point where we bring people in and we talk to people to make sure that, you know, maybe you didn't even know that there was this community of filmmakers um, up and coming or folks that would be able to, to capitalize or create business ventures based on, on this new development. And uh, consultation is the way to make sure that at least you give the opportunity for people to come forward. And on the other side of things, um, we have to be careful about what we call complaining because we're calling for citizen accountability as well. That means that when the opportunities come, we have to step up and take them. Mm -hmm. I know a lot, of, a lot of us as Bahamians, we're jaded because we feel like things have just been going the same way since the beginning. Like things mm -hmm. aren't going to change. It doesn't make sense for me to come out to that public meeting or fill out that survey or, or lend my opinion to a particular conversation. So then the decisions are going to continue to be made without you. And then when you have major, potentially exciting developments like this, will continue to be left out. So it's sort of like a meeting in the middle where those consultative opportunities need to be created. Um, and we kind of have to shake ourselves because it's frustrating um, mm -hmm. with all of the other things that are going on and say, yeah, I'm going to come out because I can benefit from this thing. I know that my perspective is valuable. Um, or I know someone that, that probably has expertise that can be lent to this process. And in the absence of that, we're going to come out very likely with, with similar things where we're trying to fix it and make it benefit people after it's already happened. And that's not negative. That's just the way that things it's progress right. when you don't do it on the front end. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I'm going to be starting my UFO tour <laughs> shortly. Right. I mean, it's going to be a multi-island, a multi Inter-island destination tour. Okay. We're going to look for aliens. 
and the tour will in- I hope you don't find them. <laughs> I mean, that's the plan. I will just be honest with you. The plan is not to find them and not for them to find us. But uh, I'm thinking that this is what people want. They say, listen, I'm not going to open a four-star hotel for, to be able to participate in this market, but I will, I'm prepared to take these two boats I have, refurbish them, mm -hmm. turn them into tour guide boats, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. be going on the ocean every night looking for aliens in the sky. <laughs> it's going to be a tourism product, right? And so, but, but to really, to, to be sustainable right. and to ensure that I'm not interfering with, right? I that you, that yeah. I don't become a problem, right, that right. I'm not, you know, going opposed to policy right. and existing rules. I need to know what is the environment that I'm trying to enter. And that's what happens. That's yeah. what happens when, when we try to capitalize on opportunity. Um, we saw a lot of it with COVID and we mm. don't understand the, I mean, COVID is not the best example because we were making decisions in, in a very, very, very unprecedented sort of environment from a policy perspective. But people who had viable business ideas were finding themselves in problems because this policy landscape was created in the absence of any sort of communication or consultation. Like I said, I'm not taking a swing at that because it was an, yeah. a, a public emergency. But that is how, how a lot of countries work. It's not just us. Right. Where we're just making the decisions, making the policy. People then see the opportunity on the back end, try to capitalize, and then they're not in compliance right. with the law. And I'll give you that critique, right? It was a public emergency. But then I'm going to take and raise you one <laughs> and say, but I, don't, I can't sit on that critique because Dorian is a global emergency. Right, right. We experience things like this all the time. And we're only 400,000 people, mm -hmm. right? And so the truth is, we punch in below our weight. You're right. Right, we punch in below our weight, and we should have been prepared. I think so, But yeah. this is the type of, the, the, things that org is ad, the things that org is advocating for. Absolutely. I, I'll be honest with you all, I'm not certain about that grammar. We're on midterm break. <laughs> Take a bye. <laughs> Will help the government to operate more efficiently right. and more effectively. Right. Absolutely. Now, I got a text here. It is a very heavy critique. It says, Ms. Green, I don't believe nothing until I see it. It's hard for the opposition to get questions from the government, questions answered from the government, who they are supposed to give answers to. What you think about your questions in there, they can't even get access to nothing unless somebody decides they can leak something. I would not believe nothing these people say, come on. Oh, nothing these people come on the radio saying. Now, dear Texter, this is not a representative of the government. No, yeah. This is a representative of an NGO, a civil, a, a non-governmental organization. Right. A civil society organization that is advocating for more responsible government. Right. So, and if I could just um, clarify. So, at the Organization for Responsible Governance, the name... The name could sort of, um, because of the culture of the name in itself, gives a particular impression that we represent government. So we are an, an NGO, like Aaron said, we are a neutral, objective body. And our mission is to promote the principles of good governance across the sectors. Mm -hmm. Government is the primary decision maker for the country. And so they will always be um, at a particular place in, in making sure that the sectors can function together. But we do our work in the private sector with civil society or other nonprofits as well. And we have a keen focus on self-governance, the way that citizens um, participate in processes, are educated, are empowered, and live just, uh, I guess, uh, sustainable lives um, and livable lives in, in the Bahamas. So anything that we put forward is based on data, information, uh, feedback and commentary from, from the public, from the other sectors, and even discussions with government from conferences and, and uh, international studies as well. And we craft, uh, particularly when we talk about policy, we craft positions that we advocate with government um, to help us reach these gold standards of good governance that are very defined. It's not an opinion based. Um, we get up and we think it would be better. There are eight like defined standards of good governance. Many of them have already come up. Accountability, transparency, effectiveness and efficiency, inclusion and representation, participatory, following the rule of law. Um, and we have standards for each of those eight areas that we sort of promote. 
And that's why uh, when particular topics come up, you may see a release from us, or we may do the media rounds to talk about what we can do. Before we move on to the status of the Ombudsman's Bill, have any political parties reached out to org or contracted your services to support their candidate training programs or to provide uh, training opportunities for candidates and party members? Not directly. Um, we, we're typically proactive in that space um, uh, leading up to elections. What we do, we, ha we focus heavily on citizen education with a keen interest on empowering young voters. But we also do typically send out uh, communications, letters, and, and information on, on the standards of good governance and uh, really uh, hunkering down on the need for more public consultation. So we've gotten positive responses from all parties, independent, um, independent candidates and, and third parties from our communications, typically speaking. Um, we would love to do uh, formal training around some of these things. Um, generally speaking, I, in my time, we have not. Um, but I will definitely say uh, we do send out those communications and resources regularly. And they're typically okay to well received. All right. Yeah. Status of the ombudsman, ombudsman, ombudsman's bill. Will we see it before 2026? <laughs> It looks like we may. Um, I know that it was passed in the House, um, and I am. Um, I know that it was lower and upper, or just lower. It was passed in the lower house. Okay. Yes. Um, so I am not sure where uh, when it came up in the Senate. I know that it was slated to be debated in the Senate. Um, so it does look like we should have some progress on that. But the important thing um, that we always put forward, because we've seen this with freedom of information, where something is fully passed but not fully enacted, is two things. The first is that we need to consult with the public. The ombudsman will establish an office of someone who can uh, some, be somewhat of a public defender. When there is malpractice or maladministration of a government official, the office of the ombudsman will create a space where people can have their complaints heard in a safe and, and objective space. Um, and they, uh, it, it makes provisions for many proceedings to be able to take place. But as with any bill, will it work for family islanders, for example? Will it work for people who are typically discriminated against? Um, does it provide uh, uh, resources uh, for, for public education so folks can understand where do I go and how do I access it? Um, and those things, no matter how many clauses we put in beforehand, will not be effective unless we consult with people. And the second thing, uh, is when we see something like this passed, we have to see the budget allocation to make sure that the office can be established, the necessary staff can be hired and trained, and any technology, because we're moving into this age where let's get the tech first instead of having to do di digital transformation, we have a great opportunity, but technology costs a lot of money. So Absolutely. we need to see that reflected in the budget. And we, we're seeing that issue arise with the uh, enforcement of the provisions of the Freedom of Information yes. Act, without a doubt. Let's go to the phone line. Good morning, caller. Hey, good morning, Ms. Green. Morning, good sir. Morning, dear guest. Good morning. Yeah, I'm just chiming in on the conversation. And, of course, I'm ecstatic to hear the word ombudsman and what this young man is saying, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, I just wanted to know what this intrude or move over or this model would be. I mean, uh, let's, let's call it, uh, let's say, mal malpractice with the doctors, right? Or would this include that, like a, like, a, like a scientific ombudsman? Will, that, will you have that model where I'm dissatisfied with something in the health industry? And like, yeah, that's what I'm saying is, would this cover that? Because you know, I have a problem with paying for a blood test and then waiting to see the doctor to get the results, right? And so I'm not knocking the doctors, down, but what I'm saying is it's like, uh, it's like insulting someone's intelligence because, of course, what harm could it be to email me or, t or, or WhatsApp me the results and then the, 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 the date for the doctor could be way down the line and I want to get my blood test results to do my own intervention. So what I'm saying is it's like a, more like a dictatorship to me because with the Google or the information overload, I can go and see. Or even on the blood test, you can see the parameters of what it is and what it should be. And what is safest to the right, you'll see that the parameters, whether it be in micrograms, whatever it be. It, it, it can't do any harm. 
if, if, if you just email me my own results, so if I go to a private clinic, then and I, I, I should be able to walk into a private clinic and without a doctor and say, I want to do this particular blood test. What, what is going on in this country? I can't. Get, you see what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? It's because I paid for a blood test in the government clinic, I mean, in the clinic, but they're telling me I have to wait to see the doctor to get the results. Which, and I have to see the doctor in here, but why can't I you? What harm could that do? I'm I'll then, just hang up and listen. Absolutely, 52. Thank you. Now, so I'm not sure... The ombudsman would be able to deal with matters arising within the Ministry of Health and Wellness, right? But not necessarily a medical ombudsman that deals with specific issues. Well, I mean, I think that if it is a government service, it's not off limits, right? Right. So um, I know that the, I think the challenge comes in where. In these individual instances, define malpractice is because if that's a standard practice, for example, in the public and the private sector, I've experienced it in in, in both right. arenas. It might be difficult. Um, right. The, the conversation then is held in a different arena. Right. And so, if it's if it's not malpractice or maladministration, or, yeah. Right. So if it's not malpractice, is it maladministration? Right. And if it's not malpractice or maladministration, does it mean now? that stakeholders in the medical community now come together for a conversation about the protocols around this practice. Right, Because right. the issue 52 raises is, if I pay for the blood test, who does, who does the results, who do the results belong to? Do the results belong to me? Right. Or do, do they belong to the doctor? Right. Right, with the access to technology, I no longer need a doctor necessarily to determine the basically what this what these results are saying and then if i'm in the public health care system how long do i have to wait right to get results right. that right. i've paid for mm -hmm. right and w and then what if it is a matter of urgency what if it turns out that waiting 6 weeks waiting 8 weeks was detrimental to my health status right yeah so <laughs> with 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 health specifically i think um those those sorts of things can get a little bit tricky, right. um, but but to your point, um, finding the place where it's most appropriate to have those sorts of conversations um, is the way to go. And mm -hmm. in any arena, because once again, like I said, we advocate for for private sector. But if it is a private industry or something that should be handled through the courts, it wouldn't be incorporated into the process of of the ombudsman. Just for example, right. but we would still say that that consultation even in those private spaces or, or in, in matters that impact a lot of people just because of the way that it's set up, we do encourage for those conversations to be had between service providers and, and the people. Absolutely. Um, and I did get a message that it was passed in the Senate. So we okay. have it officially on the books. Um, has it been signed, assented to by the Governor General, and has it been gazetted yet? <laughs> That find out, but um, I mean, but I'm just saying, I'm just no, no. laying out the process, right? And so, then if I could add to that, yeah, um, will we see that in, that that incorporation in the budget? Will we understand that the funding required is actually being allocated to make this thing work? Absolutely, absolutely. On the other side of the break, we're going to talk about the Young Leaders Plastic Challenge. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. I'm being joined this morning by Stephen Evans from the Organization for Responsible government and we're talking about the work that they do in helping citizens understand governance and their role in it. You guys stay tuned to Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. We'll be right back. It's that time of year to join the movement. It's time for the annual Guardian Media's Healthy, Wealthy and Wise Fair. Saturday, March 2nd at the Mall of Marathon. Starting at 10 a.m., admission is free. Come and receive free health screenings by the walk-in clinic, fantastic product info, and sound financial advice. Participate in the exercise demonstrations by Natasha Brown, Outdoor Fitness Bahamas, and RF. There will also be a CPR demonstration by Superior Care, plus live performances by Blotty, Johnny Cake, Shine, and Carrington McKenzie, ending with a Saxon superstar, Junkanoo Russia. Join the movement. It's the annual Nassau Guardians Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise Fair, Saturday, March 2nd at the Mall of Marathon. 
Love the show? Want to give your support? Become a sponsor today. Call 302-2300 for our rates and packages. That's 302-2300. Become a sponsor on Guardian Radio 96.9 FM. Fresh news, smart talk, all day. Good morning and welcome back. But Mr. Evans, I almost didn't start the show just now. <laughs> I love that it song. Works. Listen, we are uh, this week remembering the loss of Priscilla Rollins right? as we lead into 242 Day. We're looking for songs to put on the podium next to Independence Morning. Mm -hmm. It's like a baby born in. And uh, My Bahamas is on its way to that podium along with Golden... Anniversary Bahamas <laughs> by Elkin360. <laughs> I, mean, I just love that song. I love that song. But well, let's get to it. Two topics before we end the show. Uh, public trust surveys and the Young Leaders Plastic Challenge. Now, first thing I see is grade 10 through 12, so I jealous. <laughs> I jealous some. Yes. Let's talk about the challenge. Yeah, so um, when, when we talk about citizen accountability, um, just very quickly, we, we typically split that into three things. So we public education is where heavy focus is because we can reach more people and just give them information and take in information about what it means to be a Bahamian, what your role is, and how, how does my everyday life chart a course for my country. Uh, public consultation, we talked a lot about that, is where we're taking in information and sharing it with the relevant stakeholders, but this is our public participation because we're a small team. We don't have as great a capacity to do this all the time. But we take on projects that demonstrate, okay, so when you get that education, when you're an engaged citizen, what are some of the things that you can do? And through a partner organization uh, out of Bar uh, Barbados who's doing sort of a regional project, we have this Plastic Tide Turners Challenge, which um, encourages young people to consider their role in combating plastic pollution and at large climate change and environmental conservation. Right. Uh, so we're running uh, this uh, pitch competition. Uh, in addition to some general outreach that we'll be doing with some high schools uh, here on New Providence, we're running nationally this pitch competition where students from 10th to 12th grade have the opportunity to, I want to say win 500, but it isn't just like a gift. So they can get up to $500 in funding to run an environmental project on their school campus that tackles plastic pollution. Uh, okay. It's found on our website at orgbahamas.com slash plastic challenge. And anyone from any school can enter. Uh, if, if, you, if you're a young leader and you're passionate about making friends, or if you're listening and you know a teacher or a student uh, in 10th to 12th grade anywhere in the Bahamas that might be interested, they can visit the site. Um, and what they will, we have all the information and resources there to help guide them. And they'll create a small team of students and one teacher on their campus, brainstorm an idea. Um, and submit that to us. We'll judge that, and then we're going to be having a, an actual pitch night where our top 10 entrants uh, will be able to come before a panel of judges to talk about uh, their project, and three winners will be selected uh, to actually enact their project on their campus. It, it really gives them the opportunity to put on display leadership. All right, and it is a campus-based project, right? Yes, it's a campus-based so, so project. The, the, the project is to be operated on the campus or in the, or operated on the campus or from the campus? Yes. So, okay. and on the campus is, is self-explanatory, but from the campus is a good point. Um, I know that we'll be open to submissions for students that want to involve their school and something in its surrounding community as well. Mm -hmm. Because when we promote active citizenship, uh, which is the, the, I guess, the key term that we've used at org to describe a citizen that is engaged, the idea is we always want to start with our community. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people um, of all ages, and I think when we get passionate about a thing, we're all a little bit guilty of running really, really quickly out of the gate, going straight to government, going straight to the top and trying to, to just shift the entire country. But the reality is, uh, you know, there's that saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to create an environment where people understand, I got to start at home. I got to start at my school. I need to start in my immediate community and space. So we were really excited to be able to uh, run this Plastic Tide Turners project um, 
here in the Bahamas because it is happening throughout the Caribbean in, in different iterations. Um, and this is our version of empowering people to start at their community level uh, to take a stand against pollution. And, you know, as an environmentalist, I'm particularly happy to be able to take on this project after having stepped away from, uh, from that space for the last few years to work on the good goal of governance. Um, but this is a really great, great crossover point where we can take our citizen engagement initiatives and marry it with something that empowers young people to, to take a stand for a very, very beautiful country. Listen, dear young people, because I know some of y'all still still on midterm break. Before <laughs> we had the uh, plastic ban legislation mm -hmm. that required us to you to get to incorporate biodegradable and eco-friendly bags mm -hmm. and get rid of uh, the non-recyclable plastic. Mm -hmm. Y'all go on YouTube. There's one video there mm -hmm. where they show you how to take the bags mm -hmm. and iron them together, apply heat to them, yep. and they turn into mats, right? Mm -hmm. So you could turn them not just into mats for your car when you go to the beach to keep the sand out of your uh, interior and your upholstery, but you could make cutting boards. And you could make cut conch salad, like temporary cutting boards that you sell to tourists who want a little keepsake of their time in the Bahamas. They won't go home and pretend like they're making <laughs> conch salad, right? Like... There are all kinds of things we could be doing. We could be taking empty uh, water and soda bottles and turning them into walls, yep. using them as part of structure for walls, for community gardens in the school, or semi-permanent raised beds for agricultural products in the school or in the community, You know, which is something sturdier than a wooden raised bed that could be blown down in the wind, right? Yep. All kinds of things. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because I think when we think plastic pollution, um, and there's nothing wrong with cleanups, I'm a huge cleanup fan, but typically that's where we run to. Um, mm -hmm. a cleanup on the school campus. If anyone is hearing this and wants to do a cleanup because his school desperately needs it, that is totally fine. Yeah. Um, but there are so many other things that could be done. And if I might say, even with the plastic ban, if you look at the story behind how that happened, shout out to Crystal Ambrose, who is the director of Bahamas Plastic Movement. She really, really gave a huge push along with students from Saudi Luthra, mm -hmm. um, and they were instrumental in not just cleaning up the beaches of Eleuthera, uh, but getting that legislation in place. So many people thought that that would never happen. And, and while there are, so we still have a really long way to go, it shows the power that, you know, young people and people of all ages, when we come together, um, you know, and we channel that youthful energy that is not needed by the way that the world is, we can really do some incredible things. And that, that's one of the reasons we're super excited about this project. So from plastic upcycling, recycling and upcycling to mechanisms to pull plastics out of harbors, mm -hmm. out of the ocean, out of creek systems, all kinds of ideas are welcome, eh? Yes, That's yes, a, a wonderful idea. I mean, i just so jealous. <laughs> Your 10th and 12th graders, take, 10th through 12th graders take advantage of mm -hmm. this and bring younger members of the school on board, right? Just because you are the person leading the project doesn't mean you can't get younger students involved as well. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point because um, when we, we definitely want to highlight the ability, but because it's a project and, and we're going to take these things in phases just by the nature of the way that we do our work. We have to start somewhere. But there is so much that can be done and there are so many, uh, the, the passion of young people as, as someone who's worked in, in youth development um, directly and, and indirectly for my entire career, it is just something that is incredible. And, and for anyone that, that thinks that this is really an opportunity, even to add to you to say that I took a stand and I did something unique and, and I got other people involved, um, this is a great opportunity. Uh, to to make an impact um, in your community and in your environment and to bring others along with you as you do that. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, public trust surveys. Oh, the good stuff. <laughs> so to touch really quickly, um, in all of this conversation, one of the things that, that brings it together, at org, one of our goals is to build bridges so that we can combat this concept that Citizens taking a stand means opposition to the powers that be. Mm -hmm. It's a collaboration. We want to build bridges between citizens and government with things like Access Parliament and the Policy Review Center so that when laws are made, for example, everyone is a part of the process. But there are obstacles to that. It's not just as being jaded or upset or, or the, the marginalized communities having to deal with daily challenges that we take for granted. 
but in addition to that, what we find is there are other factors that influence our, our desire to partner with and collaborate with. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of global studies that look at trends in declining public trust. So uh, we're funding from the Templeton Religion Trust. Basically, we have been running this project to do surveys and focus groups, understanding Bahamians' relationship with trust in their government. And our initial findings are that we have a long way to go, um, but we have these public trust surveys available on our website at orgbahamas.com slash community survey where we look at the factors of trust building in the Bahamas so that we can create a list of recommendations on what the government can do and what the people can do as well as civil society and the private sector to build more trust in the first place so that initiatives that we put forward can be successful. Orgbahamas.com community, community survey. survey. Yes. Let me repeat it. Org, O-R-G, Bahamas.com forward slash community survey. survey. Uh, your feedback is so important. In fact, we've developed a culture that, of, that's anti-feedback. We've developed a culture where people feel insulted. They feel publicly shamed. If you give them feedback or if you attempt to engage them in any troubleshooting exercise to attain what we call feedback. Yeah. Right, And so it's important to shift that culture for us to make it accessible, state actors accessible, so that people will give feedback because that's the resource that you run on. Right. If you're a politician, you, your motor runs on feedback. Yes, yes, it does. You know? And here are civil society organizations attempting to support that function. Miss y'all. <laughs> Everybody at all, we miss y'all. Yes, and we would love to have some more discussions on public trust because we're going to be doing this for the next year. So if folks stay plugged in. Yeah. So do me a favor. Let's track the status of the Ombudsman Act. Yes. Right? It's been passed in the Senate. I guess we're now awaiting a send from the Governor General for it to be gazetted. Yes. Announce the date of enforcement. And uh, any reservations, anything that's not being enforced, we need to be aware of. Yes. Thank you very much, Stephan Evans. We are all out of time. It's been great. Absolutely. Come back soon. We will. Bring the rest of them set. We got to meet please? the new team. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's refreshing as well. Org is also modeling secession plans. Yes. And continuity. Yes. Right? But people change, but policy remains the same. Absolutely. So thank you very, very much to the listening audience and to the Texas. Texas, thank you for joining the conversation. You guys will be back soon. Yes, we will. Thank you, everyone. Listen, stay tuned. Guardian Radio AM and CA Newry is second half of the Wednesday Man Down Mash Up Session. Steph and I had nothing to mash y'all up on. <laughs> Better luck next time. We'll be right back, Bahamas.